So as you saw in the announcements, excited to start next week, new Christmas-themed sermon series called Emptied. We're going to pick up on the theme of humility that comes out of the Christmas story. But for tonight, finishing up what is a little two-part series, talking about church, kind of sandwiching our church general meeting. I kicked it off last week looking at Ephesians 3, uh, verses uh, 1 to 13. And tonight I'm going to kind of close out Ephesians 3, so it's just looking at this one passage, verse 14 through to 21. And you might remember, if you were here last week, uh, that you kind of have to do those two passages together, because it kind of starts with Paul going on this thought train, going, for this reason, and then there's that dash, remember? And he gets sidetracked, and it's 12 verses of getting sidetracked. We looked last week at the sidetrack. Now today we pick it up in verse 14, which is the original thought, what he had in, the, in, in mind in the first place. So it goes back in verse 14 to, for this reason, and the original thought is simply a prayer. I guess it's not simply a prayer. It's one of the greatest recorded prayers. It's a prayer that is so majestic. And we get to read it tonight, and we get to study it, and we get to pray it. The great preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preaching on just this passage, so verse 14 through to 21, this prayer, preached a whopping total of 17 sermons on this one little passage. I'm going to try to do that all in one tonight. 17 sermons. It really is truly rich. And when I look at it, it's not kind of the type of prayers that I would normally pray on a day-to-day basis. Don't know about you. Think about kind of what the normal agenda of your prayers might be like, what you would normally pray for. I think we would mostly start with asking, help, these are the things I need for the day, these are my concerns, what I'm worried about. And hopefully we would switch to thanking God for for what he's done in the day or the day before. And then I think mostly we would get to that space of asking for forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong. That's generally the content of my prayers, most of our prayers which are all valid prayers, absolutely. But I wonder if sometimes we miss praying some of the great prayers. Here's what I mean by that. Don Carson, another Bible scholar, put it this way. He said, we have the right to pray for many things. In fact, I I would say, we have the right to pray for anything. But the problem is, he says, we have the right to pray for many things. The problem is we seem to only really pray for lesser things. This prayer we're going to look at tonight is a prayer for the greatest of things. So you ready? Let's have a look. Turn or tap in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to read from verses 14 through to verse 21. And it says this. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever Amen. 
So I'm going to be really traditional tonight and break up the sermon or this prayer into the four P's of prayer. Aren't you all proud? Going to be four clear points, all alliterated. If you're one of the kinds of people who love for the sermon outline to be clear and to make notes, this is your day. Take it while you have it. All right, so here we go. Number one is the posture of this prayer. So Paul opens by saying, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. So the posture of this prayer is kneeling. Now that may seem ordinary to you if you've read any children's book that has prayer. The picture is of a person kneeling when they pray. I don't know how many of you kneel when you pray. I do not. I find it incredibly uncomfortable. But that's kind of, we would just normally see kneeling in prayer and say that makes sense. Except that when it's written, it's actually quite surprising because ordinarily, especially in those times, people stood while praying. So this is quite a surprise. I bow my knees. What's so important about this posture of kneeling, of bowing at the knees? Well, I think firstly, it signifies intent. So here's what I mean by that. A lot of our praying um, can also be kind of casual as you go through the day. This is generally on prayer and kind of you driving or in the shower, or cooking, whatever it is. And when you think about it, you're mindful. That becomes a prayer, which is a beautiful way to pray but when it comes to this subject matter it's kind of the idea is not like we need to come before God with great intentionality and pray these kinds of prayers it's not just a casual oh by the way we strengthen me with with power in my innermost being so that's part of it but I think mostly this posture of kneeling is meant to indicate reverence Respect. Ultimately, one day, we as Christians know, every knee will bow when it becomes evident that Jesus is Lord. Amen? And so we do that already now because he's already king of our lives. And so it is. It's a sign of submission. It's a sign of respect. It's a posture typically reserved for coming before a powerful king. Except, and this is where it gets interesting, it says... For this reason, I bow my knees before, you would expect, kneel, coming before, bow my knees before, the king of the universe. True, but that's not what it says. It says, I bow my knees before, the, you all got Bibles in front of you, Father, this is why I love preaching with people, can actually talk back to me. Bow my knees before the Father, you've got to see this, that's surprising, Because on the one hand, it's this picture of a sovereign, powerful, majestic king that you bow before. But on the other hand, he's known as Father. Do you love that about Christianity? We come, we get entrance before the king of the universe. But it's not meant to be this trembling, intimidating. We have confidence because we get to call him Father. Did you know most of the New Testament descriptions of God uses the word Father? Yes, he is king of the universe. Yes, he is omnipotent. But we get to, through Jesus Christ, call him Father, which is interesting. I love that Tim Keller speaking on prayer and this aspect of this contradiction of sorts, as it were, of a king, but yet familiarity that we get to approach. He says this about prayer. He says, the only person who dares to wake up a king at 3 a.m. in the morning to ask for a glass of water is his child. We have that kind of access, that kind of familiarity, where we get to come and make these requests. That's the posture this prayer, bowing, but bowing before Father. Now, number two, the premise of this prayer. And by that, I mean the basis, because we're going to ask for some heavy things, some weighty things. You're going to see that, get to that in a moment. On what would we base that? Partly, it's this confidence that we can come before the Father, who is a king, but there's more here. 
It gives confidence that we can ask for these kinds of things. So what is the premise? Can God give this to us that we're about to ask for? And that's where, again, it, before we get to the prayer part, the asking part, it says that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you. So that's the basis, the premise. According to what will he give us these things? According to the riches of his glory, he will grant us. And I want to pick up on that because if we were doing a little series through Ephesians, it would be incredibly evident that a major theme is the riches, the riches of God. Before you get a little too carried away, it's not talking particularly about finances. It's not less than that, but it is way more than that. Here's, here's how the idea of riches comes through in the book of Ephesians. It's beautiful. Right in the beginning, chapter 1, verse 7 says, the, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished upon us. Again, it's the idea of the abundance that God has and how he abundantly gives the riches of his grace that he lavishes upon us. Verse 18 of chapter 1. The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's a massive word, inheritance. Chapter 2, verse 4, that God being rich in mercy. Verse 7 of chapter 2, that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. And then last week we came across this verse, chapter 3, verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Do you pick up on this theme of riches, but all of these descriptions of the riches? So it's riches of mercy, grace, inheritance, but it says like immeasurable, unsearchable. That's the premise. We're coming before this king who's Storehouses are infinite and inexhaustible. And so you can come to him with these pretty big requests. Now, I don't know about you, but like what that does for me is that that gives another sense of confidence. So confidence coming from Father, but also this is a form of confidence. So again, I mean, it seems to me sometimes, so some people are good at asking for things. Some they're just like, they're just happy to just go out and like ask for stuff. <laughs> kind of for me, when I'm wanting to ask somebody for something, particularly if it's big, like I'll typically preface it with, hey man, you know, I was wondering if maybe if it were at all possible, like if you've got the time, and really if it's okay, and if it's not gonna, you know, please would you, if it's possible, you know what I mean? You like preface it with all of these things. You're so timid to ask if it's possible, maybe. Th this premise is saying, yes, it is possible. It just, it is. Whatever it is you're coming with, it's possible. Can we just ask now? That's what this does for me. It's setting that up. And you're going to see that later. It is possible and more. So that's the premise. It's this posture of bowing before the Father, knowing that behind him is inexhaustible, infinite ability to do and give. And now here comes the subject of this prayer. Here's what we're going to be asking for. And it's, it's four different things. So bear with me. Four points, four sub points. It's all wonderfully outlined. And alliterated. So here we go. Here's what we're asking for. Firstly, to be strengthened with power. Now just, let me just say this. All of these things, I'm going to come to you. They're the things that we just, it's kind of got that spiritual language to it. And it's like, oh, cool. But like, just listen. Read this afresh. We're asking to be strengthened with power in our inner being. That's what it says. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power in your inner being. 
I don't know what that means to you, but here's what that means to me at this point of what has been a pretty exhausting year. Anybody else feeling that? Now for me, again, whenever I'm like feeling weak, trained, and like you gotta get up and you gotta act and just feeling like so exhausted, I, t- I tend to just kind of feel like you've got to sum that up. Like I've got to sum up that strength from within. Kind of suck yourself up, you know? At the beginning of the day, you wake up and you're exhausted and you've got a lot before you. And so you look into the mirror and you go, yeah, man, this is your day. You can do this. I don't do this, by the way. This is... <laughs> But you know what it is? Do you know what I mean? It's that sense of you're about to go into big meaning. Like even, even now, to be honest with you, and I come up like, like sum it up. Like what this says is no, you don't have to sum it up from within yourself. We're asking to be strengthened from the outside. We're saying, hey God, grant that I may be strengthened with your power in my inner being through your spirit. Right? Isn't that just such a relief? You don't have to sum it up anymore. And I think we've all got to this end of the, the end of this year realizing, man, like, we can't. Those, that storehouse, my own storehouse of energy, physical and emotional energy is definitely not infinite. <laughs> It is very compromised. You don't have to sum it up anymore. God, may you grant that to be strengthened with power in our inner being. Speaking of which, power can be, that sounds like something strange. I mean, power is a dangerous word, isn't it? The political power, authority, I can dominate at work physical power that can be abused. It's not any of those things we're asking for, right? Right, that was the easy, that was the easy question. And again, here's how we know, in our inner being, and I wanna focus there a little bit because, again, if we're honest, that just, that sounds like a bit of a letdown, considering the difficult circumstances around us Perhaps we would far rather pray, God, by your power, drastically change everything happening around me. Isn't, wouldn't that be better? Now, like, oh, wait, oh, it's only internal stuff. <laughs> right, and again, because as, as human beings, we, we, we live so externally. And maybe what this prayer is reminding us of, at least as individuals and as a church, is the reality of what's truly important is what's happening on the inside, actually. So there's this word I came across that I, that I really love. It's a new word for me, I'll share it with you. Maybe it'll add to your own vocab. It's the word inscape. Anybody heard the word inscape before? Already? Okay. Now you can write that down, add it to your dictionary. So it's like landscape. Landscape, we know, it's this, I used to be into photography, had that phase, and I uh, loved taking you know, landscapes, beautiful, majestic scenes. So it's like landscape, but on the inside, inscape, acknowledging that what's happening on the inside is also vast and beautiful and complex and worthy of great attention. And in fact, as Christians, we know that actually it's the inscape on the inside. It's out of our heart issue, all of life. And so what this prayer is reminding us of is that actually when things change on the inside, when we're strengthened with power in our inner being, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside as long as we're strengthened on the inside. And that's what this prayer is, is acknowledging. 
the reality of the inscape and how God can and wants to strengthen us with power in our inner being. So there's this outdoor shop that I, that I used to love. I see a lot of them are closing down, but their kind of logo, whatever it is, was be an outsider. They'd be like, yeah, I'm, I want to be an outsider. Go into the shop. And actually what I'm saying now tonight is don't be an outsider. Be an insider. We live with far too much focus on the outside. And what this is reminding us of at the least is what's most important is what's happening on the inside. And that's the place where God can strengthen us with his own power through his spirit. Amen? That's the first thing we're praying for. Don't take that lightly. Strengthened with power in a, in a, in a being. Secondly, we're praying that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. That Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. Now, if you're kind of my age or older, maybe you're like, but wait, like that happened when I first became a Christian. Why? Because for most of us of that age, it was quite traditional that if, you know, kind of there was some kind of outreach or crusade of some sorts, and the gospel was preached, and there was some response, but almost always the response would be along, along the lines of inviting Jesus into your heart. Anybody heard that before? That's what we were doing. We were inviting Jesus to live in our hearts. So now you're going, well, wait, I did that. Like, why, why is this a prayer now? What's interesting is that whole idea of inviting Jesus into your heart. This is the only place in the Bible where that kind of idea exists of Christ living in your heart, except here it's written to Christians. Not non-Christians, not people becoming Christians. It's written to Christians. So why would a Christian ask for Christ to dwell in their hearts when they're already a Christian? And so here's where this, this idea of the word dwell it's kind of this idea of take a permanent residency. So it's very different to inviting someone over as a guest. Like you're here now, and hey, do you want to come over to my house like afterwards for some coffee, inviting them as a guest? This is different. Inviting in can be like a guest. This is inviting Christ to take up permanent residency. That's very different to just inviting somebody over. That's a different word. And I wonder if a lot of the time our Christianity is more like inviting Jesus kind of as the guest, which again is very different. You invite somebody over to your house and especially if it's kind of like spur of the moment, you like rush home like from church now and just make sure you get home like 10 minutes before they arrive and quickly clean up the house if it's like Anything like my house and kids, I just blame the kids, you know. What do you do? You like take everything, you just throw it into one room, right? We've all got that one room. You just chuck stuff there. And then people come over and you're giving them the tour of the house, but like you just conveniently forget to show them that room, right? Obviously. When someone comes over as a guest, you don't show them every room. You don't show them the room with all the junk, that room. You might not also show them like your bedroom. I don't know, that's kind of personal. You might, but you show them the kitchen and and those spaces, and I wonder if, again, treating Jesus as this guest that we invite over from time to time is this idea of certain parts of our lives that we don't let him into, especially the messy bits and the personal space. Now, that's my personal space, finances and things that are my own hopes and dreams. We're too scared to let Jesus into I wonder if we treat him as a guest more than take up permanent residency. You know how it is with guests as well. They've come and it was this great idea to invite them over and then like it's getting, it's getting time, you know, for them to like go. <laughs> it's like that awkward moment of trying to communicate. We're over, this is done now, right? <laughs> you're like, oh man, you're just stick at the time. Is it already? Oh my goodness me. I'm so tired, I got such a heavy day tomorrow. You know what I mean? You're all like, yeah, you know what I mean. It's that awkward like sending them on their way. 
And again, I, I wonder if as Christians, a lot of the time, we treat Jesus as this guest. Yeah, we entertain him for some time, but then it's like, all right, it's time to find for me to get down to, you know, what I've got to do. That's what's different here. It's not this invite over as guest. That's why this has been written to Christians. No, 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 the idea here is Christ gets to take permanent residency. And if he's taking permanent residency, he has access to every room. And he has free reign. If you're inviting someone to live in your house, become part of the family, as it were, they have access, they see everything. You're like, you know, feel free to help yourself to what's in the fridge, what's in the cupboards. In other words, bottom line is this. Christians are to live as if they know Christ owns the house. It's not just a resident that you have invited temporarily. He owns it. And that's what you're praying for here. That he takes up residency, ownership, has access to all the rooms. That's what we're praying for. All right, third thing that we're asking for here, that is part of this prayer, is that we would grow in our knowledge of his love and that his love would become the foundation for our existence. That's what it says, that you've been rooted and grounded. That is firstly a biological metaphor, the roots, the source of life, and it is an architectural metaphor, grounded, the foundation. Both of them added together is this idea that the very source of our living is a knowledge of his love, and not just any kind of love, a love that is incomprehensible, a love that is unknowable. And again, it's just fascinating how this is phrased. It says, and to know the love that surpasses knowledge. Like, wait, hang on. How can I, why would I pray to know something that's unknowable? That seems like a useless waste of a prayer. Why am I asking to comprehend something that's incomprehensible? And the idea here is, yes, his love is far beyond what we could ever think. What you're praying for is just an increased and ongoing knowledge of his love. You'll never know it to its full extent, but you grow in knowing his love. And that becomes a root and a foundation for your life. And I wonder if we come to this end of this year and because of circumstances again and relationships have been so strained and things are just so difficult and the idea of knowing how infinitely we're loved and growing in that love can be to you such a source of life. Oh, one more thing here that I find fascinating. It says that you may have the strength to comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth of what? Did you read that and give it a go? That you may comprehend what is the breadth and length and height and depth. Yes. Of what? It doesn't say, does it? We think it's this love, but it actually just falls away there. And then it says, and to know. So what do we pray and we comprehend? The magnitude of what? It's left hanging for a reason that we may comprehend the magnitude of all that God is doing in our lives, all that he is doing. I mentioned to you a few weeks ago how just what God is doing in our lives is a million times a million times more than we are even faintly aware of. That's this prayer God just that we would know, see, the breadth and height and length, the depth of all that you're doing and grow daily in our knowledge of your love so that it can be a root and a foundation. Lastly, what we're asking for, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, come on now. Who, who prays like that ever? God, fill me with all your fullness. I mean, I don't, but here it is, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, that doesn't mean you're going to become like God. Don't get you know, this <laughs> idea. 
What it, what it means is filled with fullness. It's this idea of being satisfied or content, being fulfilled. I don't know about your year again, but this idea that you could truly experience contentment, contentment, peace, fulfillment, feel settled in life. That's what we're praying for, filled with all the fullness of God. So is this a massive prayer or what? Strengthened with power in my inner being. Christ takes up permanent residency. And we grow in knowledge of his love. It becomes a foundation for our living and ultimately be perfectly fulfilled and content. And you're going, oh, come on now. That, that's big prayer. Well, Paul prays that. I mean, this is already for me the greatest prayer. And then he adds this just by the way. He just kind of slaps on top of that. And now unto him who is able to do all of that and to do far more abundantly than those things that you could ask, than anything you could ask, and that anything you could even think or dream about. I mean... Now he's able to do that and so much more. And I want to just end with this idea here. And, and so far we've spoken about this from a personal level. And I want us to get now into a time of praying this personally. And then we're going to step back into this text and then pray for our church. Because it doesn't end individuals. But I don't want us to miss this. Now unto him who is able to do this and so much more. And come to him now, the end of this monstrously difficult year. And I just want you now, so in this time of prayer, just close your eyes. And I, all I want you to do is just imagine God, the Father, the King, standing before you saying, just imagine this. I'm able to do this in you and so much more. Just picture God saying to you, I'm able to do this in you and so much more. And so why don't you ask him now? Maybe for you it is this idea of being strengthened with power in your inner being. Realizing the landscape, the difficult landscape has exhausted you. And now being reminded that if we strengthen on the inside, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. Maybe you just want to ask, God, grant me to be strengthened with power through your spirit. Or maybe you want to ask that you would know this love that surpasses knowledge and that it would once again be the foundation of your life. Or you want to reaffirm, Jesus, take up residency in my life. And I'm sorry for keeping aspects of it away from you. And for ushering you out as a guest. Would you take up permanent residency? And or maybe you want to ask, God, that we would be filled with all of your fullness being perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I'm able to do this in you and so much more. Amen? All right, let me bring you back. Because the last P 
is the purpose of this prayer. It says in verse 21, to him be glory in the church, in the church. So this brings this prayer back to the church. Remember last week that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the heavenly places. Now, it's that in the, through the church, the glory of God is made known. And man, if, think about this prayer, these four things and more. How much do we need to pray this for our church? That we be strengthened in our core as a church, etc., etc. And so I want to invite you, please pray with me as we extend this prayer now and pray it for our church. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, King of the universe, we now come before you as this gathering of your people, your church, praying that you would be glorified through us, Lord Jesus, through Rosebank Union Church. Would you strengthen our church with your power at the very core of who we are. Because we realize that in our own strength, we can do nothing. So strengthen us as the individuals that make up this church. This new core, this new leadership, the new everything. May we move from this point forward being strengthened with your power through your Holy Spirit. And we pray that Jesus, you would take up permanent residency here. We acknowledge you as owner, as head of this whole church. And may we be rooted and grounded in your love. Not just to Soak it up for ourselves, but share it with the good people of Joburg and beyond. And may we as a church grow and grow and grow in maturity until we've reached the fulfillment of all that you have planned for us. Please do these things and abundantly more through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.